of groups and um, so it's great great timing so wonderful Good. Absolutely. Yeah, we all need that connection right now as much as we can get. Yeah. So uh, there are 40 of us here, which is awesome. And uh, I think let's go ahead and and get started. And just let me um, introduce Rebecca. Um, And I just want to say it's kind of um, funny how we met in the sense that so a lot of you, if you've come to Adult Forum, you've been in some of our programs, will know Emily Malkoon, who is a a friend of, of mine and a former classmate at Harvard Divinity School. And Emily has, um, has done some programming with us on, on mental health and well-being uh, over the last you know, couple of years, I would say. And we were talking about this topic and what this might look like. And um, Emily wasn't able to make that happen this summer. Uh, of course, you know, Emily and Rebecca and so many people who care for um, the mental health and well-being of, of so many people during this time are very, very busy. Um, and so she said, but I have this great friend, Rebecca, and um, could I put you in touch? And so Emily has uh, once again made this really great connection for us. And I'm really excited to introduce Rebecca McDermott. And I, Rebecca, I don't have like the whole bio, um, but uh, Rebecca's uh, a marriage and family counselor and she's based in... Um, Erdenheim. Erdenheim, right? Erdenheim, uh, right down the road. And uh, we've had a chance to talk about uh, you know, the kinds of things we're experiencing um, during this time of pandemic. Uh, from a mental health and wellness perspective, and uh, she was gracious enough to to be with us this morning to to share some thoughts with us. Yes, thank you so much. I am so excited to be here and um, really appreciate you all allowing um, me the opportunity to come in and speak about mental wellness and that there is a conversation happening about it as well, um, because there is just so much happening right now and placing an emphasis on how we can care for our mental health um, during this pandemic time is paramount. So thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, as Keith said, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist with a private practice in Erdenheim. And in being in private practice, I have really gotten to develop, um, you know, my own, my skills and my own style, but I have found the beauty and power of human connection to just be so healing and wonderful. And I always knew it was there in other settings, but getting to develop it even more um, has just been so lovely. And I think that's one of the hardest things right now is a huge impact of um, COVID-19 is the impact that it has had on our, um, on our relationships and really, you know, while Zoom and technology has created it's such a great tool for us to stay connected, it still is not the real human connection. Um, so not being able to embrace your loved ones for so long, I know has been just so difficult. Um, and one of the impacts that COVID has had, not to mention um, our concerns about our physical health, actually getting sick, um, family and friends getting sick, Um, but also the financial and community impacts COVID has had as well. Um, So today I'm hoping to be able to help everyone to have a more of an understanding of um, how things show up in their bodies, how we can begin to recognize stress and tension in our bodies, um, and also some more awareness of our emotions as messengers of information so that we can tap into really what we need and how we can communicate those needs to ourselves and to others. Um, so if everyone's okay, would love to lead you through a body scan exercise right now. Um, and I don't know if you're okay or not, but I'm going to do it anyway. So. <laughs> We're good. We're here. We're here for it. <laughs> okay. So I have a little script I'm going to read off of. Um, a body scan is an activity that it's just, it's bringing awareness to what is happening in your body and it creates a connection for your physical and physiological state um, to your emotional state. Um, and again, you know, our, our bodies and brains are just big information processing machines. So sometimes when we feel disconnected, especially with all the stress that we're experiencing right now, um, we can we're not so sure what's happening um, and it can create more overwhelm for us all. So this body scan is a great activity to just be able to put yourself back into attunement with your own body. Um, So I'm going to read off a script and you might notice my voice gets a little slow and softer um, as we move through this. Okay. 
So I will just ask everyone to begin by bringing your attention into your body. You can close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. If it's not comfortable to close your eyes, maybe just softening your gaze, looking at the floor. You can notice your body, seat it wherever you are, feeling the weight of your body on the chair, on the floor. Take a few deep breaths here. And as you take a deep breath, bring in more oxygen enlivening the body. Imagine filling up your lungs from the bottom to the top. And as you exhale through your mouth, having a sense of relaxing, sinking in more deeply. Notice your feet on the floor. Notice the sensations of your feet touching the floor the weight and pressure, vibration, heat. You can notice your legs against the chair, the pressure, pulsing, heaviness, lightness. Notice your back against the chair. Bring your attention into your stomach. If you if your stomach is tense or tight, let it soften and take a breath here. Notice your hands. Are your hands tense or tight? See if you can allow them to soften. Notice your arms. Feel any sensation in your arms. Let your shoulders be soft. Notice your neck and throat. Let them be soft, relax. Soften your jaw. Move your tongue from the top of your mouth and relax it. Let your face and facial muscles be soft. Notice your whole body present. Take one more breath. Be aware of your whole body as best as you can. Take a breath. And then when you're feeling ready, gently flutter your eyes open. Return your breath to normal. We put some feeling back in your fingers and your toes as you come back to center. Okay. Keith, thank you for participating. How was that for you? Uh, I, I didn't realize how tense I was. My hands were like. <laughs> <Yeah. Thank you. laughs> Absolutely. So that really is that awareness of, um, my body in a state of tension versus my body in a state of relaxation. Um, and the tenser you are, it's so hard to even, we don't even realize how tense we are. Um, you know, I know I, I drive around with my shoulders up at my ears all the time, and then my tongue is always glued to the roof of my mouth. So it's an active practice for me to allow my shoulders to roll down my back and unglue my tongue from the roof of my mouth and shake my jaw around. Um, so this is a great exercise that um, you could do at home to just sit and be mindful for a few moments, um, allowing yourself, it's an active relaxation and noticing the, the difference of um, what tension looks like and what it feels like. Um, and then getting to know and befriend your body of where might you, you know, be one place or a couple places that you feel tension regularly so that you can, um, you know, send some healing there, some breath or massage or touch. Um, that can, again, be your messenger of when I am feeling tension and stress rather than being in, being tensed and stressed. Um, 
So we really, we need to be aware of that, as, you know, especially regularly and during this pandemic time, I think with so much changing so rapidly and without um, really understanding what's happening, that tension place has become our regular place. Um, so we really have to pay attention um, and create an awareness of what's happening. Um, and then you can also ask yourself, you know, how do I, what do I do behaviorally when I'm tense? Um, what, are, what are my emotions and moods like when I'm tense or feeling this stress? Um, you know, do I tend to be shorter with people? Do I tend to eat more, drink more, sleep more? Um, what are the other indicators that I have that I am um, living in a state of tension? Okay. Um, I'm going to bore everybody a little bit and talk about your brain function. <laughs> so <laughs> I won't talk too long about it, um, but I think it's really important for us to have some awareness of what's happening right now um, in our brains. Um, we have this really old part of our brain called the amygdala. I don't know. Have you ever heard of that before, Keith? Okay. Yeah. So, and maybe you guys have talked about this before. <laughs> um, but the amygdala is this little almond-shaped, um, you know, part that's in the, you know, down closer to your brainstem. Um, but its sole action is to assess threat or fear. Um, and it's that fight or flight or freeze um, response. The amygdala is entirely responsible for that. Um, and I think what's happening right now with the pandemic is the amygdala is on overdrive because there are just threats, real or perceived, coming from everywhere. And so you might have noticed that as um, towards the start of quarantine and, and the pandemic, um, you might have been a little bit more in activation mode. There might have been some more adrenaline. There might have been some more anxiety um, as that was you know, your amygdala's quick reaction to the pandemic, right? Um, stay in your home, you know, stay away from people, avoid touching your face. You know, it's doing its job to keep us safe. Um, but as we continue, I think the reaction of the amygdala is causing us to kind of numb and just be in this more um, just numb, almost depressive state as we've stayed here longer. Um, because again, it's a way of protecting us against the fear and the threats of the virus. Um, so you might be feeling yourself be more exhausted at this point than you were at the beginning. I think when we had an initial, uh, oh, this is going to be two weeks, and then <laughs> I can do this for two weeks, maybe it's going to be a little bit like a vacation. This is so nice. We all get to slow down together. Um, what, the, you know, how we had to readjust after the two weeks. Um, and then how we were asked to readjust again, and even still how we're being asked to readjust. Um, I know I have three little kids myself, so having to switch into um, not only providing telehealth, you know, which is something I hadn't done before, and I needed to you know, create a tolerance and get training for, but then also taking on the um, full-time caretaking and education of my kids. When school was finally over, I, I was like, oh, there's going to be such freedom. And I have been met with exhaustion on the other side because I just didn't realize how, um, you know, I had just been in that place where I couldn't, couldn't put anything down. I wasn't able to emotionally process what was happening. I just had to do. So when I had some more time to process what was happening, I found myself pretty exhausted on the other side. And so that's a really common response because um, with fear, you know, the, our amygdala helps us turn down our emotions a bit. We don't really have much time to process what's happening. Um, and by processing, I mean acknowledging the fear and placing other emotions with it, creating cognitive thought. Um, when we are, you know, we have that, the reaction of the amygdala is to fight, flight, or freeze. We just have to, you know, that's our split second response. And that's all we can do to get through a really challenging time. So part of this is your brain function. It's controlling your hormones, cortisol or adrenaline. Um, and it can definitely increase anxious or depressive states. 
um, and dull your emotional experience. And I, I'll stop boring everybody with the brain function, but. <laughs> so part of our job is to really, um, is to um, at some point really acknowledge the functions that are happening so that we can, we can help slow that amygdala down, right? We really need that. That's such a, an old survival tool to keep us safe. Um, but at some point we need to start being like uh, our own investigators and talk to our amygdala a bit and say, hey, I need to slow this down. Is this threat real or perceived? Um, is this, you know, I am feeling numb. I'm feeling numb because this is really hard for me. What can I do that's different? You start to engage what we call um, your thinking brain, which, you know, processes emotions and thought and spurs us to um, have a higher order level of thinking rather than just out of this fear-based place. So we certainly need our amygdala to function, but when it overfunctions or we rely on it too much, um, it can definitely start to leave us in that, that numb space. Okay. Um, here's another thing that I'm noticing. I'm noticing so many people um, shooting themselves in this pandemic. I should be getting all these projects done that I said I was gonna do. I should be doing all of this. Um, and you might really find yourself, you know, for some folks, you might find yourself able to complete a lot of projects, or you might find yourself really unable to focus right now. I just kind of want to normalize all of those responses because no one has any um, you know, cognitive understanding of what it's like to live through a pandemic. We are all experiencing this and going through this struggle together, um, but it's new. So every day it's a constant adjustment to what's happening. Um, so if there's one thing I could ask everybody to, to stop doing to help their mental wellness, stop comparing yourself to how other people are managing the pandemic and stop shooting yourself here. Take it, slow it down. It's a day by day assessment of what's happening. Um, and the, the PowerPoint that I had created is uh, this slide on basic needs. So if you've taken like, a, I think it's Pull the, yeah. Um, and if you've taken like a psychology 101 course in uh, high school or college, you have probably seen this Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, pyramid. So I just wanted to use this as an illustration for everybody because um, we always need to, here's where I see people getting trapped. Um, I should be doing this. I should be living my life to the fullest. You know, trapped in these higher level places, the esteem or self-actualization. And what I want to remind everybody during this pandemic time is that we are, we need to be making sure that our physiological and safety needs are being met. Those basic needs need to be met before we can get to that actualization phase. So when you find yourself getting caught in the should, that world, I want you to ask yourself, am I meeting these basic needs? Am I drinking enough water to get me through the day? Am I eating you know, enough food? Am I nourishing my body in the way that it needs to be nourished? Um, am I feeling safe? And then even prioritizing, you know, love and belonging, community, those are higher priority before we even get to self-actualization. So acknowledging that, you know, my community is, is off because I can't connect with people. I can't hug people the way I normally would. I can't, there's a, there's discomfort in social interaction at this point. So we're not going to be able to get to that place um, regularly for, you know, a, achievement, status, self-esteem, or living life to your full potential at this point, and that's okay. And I think the reminder that none of this is linear. So e even though you might have one day where you are really um, feeling at your best, 
feeling like you are, um, you're, you know, you're winning at everything. You're accomplishing everything that you had set out to do. Um, knowing that it's okay if you have a couple days, um, you know, if you go back in a couple days and you're not feeling that great. But going back to those basic needs, you know, make, making sure I'm meeting those basic needs because that's what I truly need to function and anything beyond that is a bonus. I also want us to think about um, the, the spiritual connection as part of, you know, this love and belonging part of the pyramid. Um, knowing that if I can't connect, you know, physically to loved ones or in, this, in the way that I would like to, really calling on that spiritual self or my spiritual connection as a guide through this, um, that collective, you know, that collective place where we are going through this together um, but my faith, my belief um, is allowing me to, you know, visualize and remember what it is like to be with ones I love when I can't. And my faith reminds me that there is still good happening in all that is not good. That can definitely be a strong guiding factor during this point. Okay. Oh, am I able to move forward, Keith? Or do you uh, I, can, I can click it for you. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about um, stress. And I think this is actually going to be really helpful for um, when, and, and this, maybe this is even the challenge too. We're spending a lot of time um, in that grief place of what did the world, you know, getting back to normal and life prior to COVID, right? So there's so much grief and loss in the life that I knew prior to, you know, March of 2020 isn't really there so much anymore. And there's such a disconnect between what was and what is now. Um, and how our thoughts for the future tend to be life beyond COVID and the hope that is there. Um, but that still creates a sense of unknown and can create, again, that, that distress. So I want us to um, pay attention to stress again, and really begin to befriend <laughs> the stress process. Um, I think too often we are, you know, I am stressed or I am stressed out. Um, and it's almost like this externalization of what's happening. And so I want to remind everyone that you can look into this stress and name it so that you can take some ownership there and feel much more in control of, of yourself. You know, the whole world around us changed. And I think it's been such a shocking thing for all of us to realize how much of our structure and routine was placed in external factors, um, you know, in our routines of the day, where everybody went, how, where we spent our time, um, and not so much was really placed in um, our own structural practices or our own ways of managing, of managing stress. Um, so this is reframing stress is a formula. Reframing is um, a great therapeutic word for looking at it through a different lens. Um, so that's what therapists will often do when someone gives us a problem. We try to help, you know, you see it from a different angle or a different perspective as a way to problem solve. Um, so first, you're going to recognize that you are experiencing stress. And again, the way that you can do that is by paying attention to where it's showing up in your body or how I'm acting behaviorally. Recognizing that and then naming it. I'm experiencing stress right now because I am overwhelmed. I'm experiencing stress right now because um, I can't go to the store without a mask on. I am experiencing stress right now because I can't uh, go visit my family member in a different state. I am sad about that. I am angry about that. Oftentimes, what we do is avoid, um, we avoid the emotion. We avoid naming it because um, we can be fearful that we are going to be whiny or um, we are going to have self pity or that kind of woe is me complex. Um, what ends up happening though is that we confuse, we confuse our brain. Our brain needs that label to make sense of it and then to know what to do. 
Um, and the purpose of emotion is emotions are messengers. So emotions are really coming up to, to send us a message and they have names so that our brain can organize and process that emotion and understand it. If we spend too much time trying to avoid, dismiss, or judge an emotional response, we end up really kind of getting stuck in that place. And you might notice that you are becoming more judgmental or defensive or um, critical, criticizing of other people um, and other people's actions. But having this inward experience of recognizing that you're experiencing stress, naming it, and naming the accompanying emotion, you have the opportunity to reframe it. So is there an opportunity here? Am I overlooking something? Am I overlooking something that is working, right? What can I do to cope? Um, again, our friend the amygdala, its job is to hold on to negative information because it keeps us, um, a long time ago, that kept us from dying. So, you know, saber-toothed tiger, bad experience, don't go near that saber-toothed tiger again, save my life. So our brains are always gonna hold on to and pay attention to negative information because it's what has kept us alive and safe for so long. Um, but as we, you know, we have this ability to um, make sure that we are tuning into what is working around us because that's, you know, that's our job and that's how we help slow down our brains, slow down the amygdala and engage the thinking part of our brain again. Um, and then asking yourself, what can I do to cope here? Um, that gives you all those strategies and I'm gonna go over some are the, the ways in which you can help take care of yourself. You know, what can I do to cope? Um, or what is, what is going right in my life? What is working well in my life? Um, is anything about this pandemic situation um, better or different in a positive way? Um, I've certainly noticed career-wise for me, as I said before, I never went near a teletherapy session. I said, oh, that's not for me. Oh, it's not going to work as well as in person. There's such a power of being in the room with people. Well then, I mean, egg on my face, <laughs> yeah, this is what we have now. Um, so it was definitely a challenge at first to get used to, you know, communicating and providing therapy and healing in this way. Um, but I've now, I'm now seeing the opportunity in, or the benefit of it, I'm able to see people all over the state of Pennsylvania, not just locally. So, the, the reach is far and wide at this point. Um, I've connected with other therapists who, um, you know, we work similarly, who I wasn't able to meet with before because schedules didn't allow for time um, or it was just more difficult or they were just a bit too far away. Um, so trying to find the opportunity, trying to find what is working in your situation. I think that's all I have to say about that one. Okay. I just watched Forrest Gump the other night, so that phrase is right on my mind. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> okay, how do we plan for the unknown when everything is so unknown right now? This is definitely um, a continuance of that grief that we are being trapped in because I think, um, you know, when this happened in March, um, my birthday is coming up next weekend. So I was like, okay, well, this should be over by my birthday. And <laughs> as long, you know, if this is still going on by then, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, here we are and it's still going on. Um, and so things are going to look different this year. And, and that's okay. I think normalizing that it's okay that things are going to look different. Um, but again, how are we planning for the unknown? Um, and this certainly is not going to touch any, you know, back to school planning or anything like that. I'm, that's far above my pay grade of what <laughs> I know how to do. And I do not envy anyone in that position because I think it's, it's very, um, that's a difficult spot right now. Um, but having this formula of what's the best case scenario, what's the worst case scenario, and somewhere in between is where we land. What's the most probable thing that's gonna happen? If we spend too much time in either extreme, 
um, we can create a lot of anxiety for ourselves. And, you know, we all have underneath anxiety is fear, fear of the unknown, the danger, the uncertainty. Um, anxiety is really the behavioral response to, to the emotion fear. And a lot of times anxiety manifests in thoughts. Um, and what we're trying to do is fill in the information, fill in the unknown. But if you find yourself with thoughts that are spiraling, um, a lot of what if thoughts, um, if this happens, then what happens? Um, we need to be able to pull back and know that our thoughts are not facts. Our thoughts are thoughts. Our brain's job is to think. And we can start to plan by asking ourselves, what is the best case of this scenario? What is the worst case? And what will probably happen? And also embracing your emotions. Like I was saying before, um, spending too much time trying to dismiss or avoid your emotions is going to um, really keep us in that negative mindset space. So as your emotions come up, it's getting, it's befriending them and labeling them. Um, and they have functions. So I'll just run through these quick, but um, anger lets us know that something is wrong or unjust. Um, a lot of times, you know, if I'm angry, I get labeled as an angry person. So I work really hard to not be angry. Um, but anger lets us know if someone's hurt us or if something is wrong. And it's okay to label it and say, this makes me feel angry. I am not anger, but it makes me feel angry. That's my response to that situation. And then I can cope with it because now I've labeled it and now I can, I can draw some coping in. Um, sadness is a response to loss, um, especially with the, you know, and grief is really, I think, a collective experience right now. Um, and sadness tells us to seek connection, which is difficult right now. Our connections are disruptive. So if, it, if I can't connect with others, um, can I connect with myself? And as I said before, you know, drawing on that spiritual self to connect with to help me through this uncertain time. Um, fear signals the need for protection and also the reaction of taking action through freeze or flee. Um, shame and guilt signals wrongdoing. Guilt is really um, if I've hurt someone else or I need to make amends to someone else. Shame can be one of those tricky things because if we spend too much time in shame, um, we can really stay there and shame um, starts to tell us bad things about ourselves, you know, so where guilt says I did something bad, shame says I am bad. And we really want to make sure if we're hearing that internal monologue that we label it as shame. I am experiencing shame here. And the way that we counteract shame is through storytelling, uh, reaching out to people who love us and, and sharing, um, sharing the story about our shame, speaking to it. Um, surprise, embracing the unknown, and then being curious. And then happiness, that thing that everybody, um, you know, we always want our lives to be happy, but I, I like to point out that happiness is really a byproduct of hard work and being vulnerable, being authentic um, in the places that you show up. So happiness is an awesome emotion, but I always like to say it's not a place that we're gonna land all the time and that's okay. Okay. All right. And then here's some routines, very simple routines that you can do for mental wellness. Um, daily check-ins with your body. Again, I know I'm like beating a dead horse with that, but where is tension showing up in your body? So run through, you know, a couple minutes at the start of your day, at the end of your day, and just, you know, paying attention to what's my jaw feeling like? Do I need to loosen it, relax it? Just checking in with what's happening in your body. Um, regular exercise like walking um, or you know, anything, yoga, anything, you know, 30 minutes of daily activity um, that can help your body move. Our bodies are meant to be in motion and providing a regular exercise um, time for your body creates stability, 
um, and stability is helpful right now because again, we were we relied very much so on our you know school or work schedules to provide structure for us, and we might not have that right now in the way that it looked before. So setting yourself up you know with these disciplined activities creates that structure for you um drinking water nourishing foods i know i sound like a mother here but that's <laughs> make sure you drink the water you know your water every day and eat your fruits and vegetables um journaling meditation prayer really great ways for everyone to start to engage that thinking brain and provide a safe place for self-reflection, um, a place where we can begin to calm and slow down. Um, when you, it might be helpful if, um, you know, journaling it, it is uncomfortable for you to use a prompt, you know, either, so with either of those things, journaling, meditation, or prayer, um, maybe picking a starting point. So a journal prompt could be, um, you know, one thing that I am missing in all of this, um, one thing I've learned about myself during all of this, it gives you a starting point for that self-reflection. Um, if you're in meditation or prayer, uh, I think the misconception about meditation is that um, you are not supposed to have any thoughts and you are just supposed to be in a, a place of nirvana. So people can get frustrated pretty fast and not wanna be, um, not wanna continue in meditation. Um, but really meditation is just allowing thoughts to exist without attaching to them. So if you find your, yourself comfortably seated and a thought comes up, allow it to be there. Um, we don't have to continue to think about it or um, place an emotion with it. Allow it to be there and then let it move on its way. Um, connect with your loved ones in whatever way you can. Um, avoid comparing yourself to others. Avoid shooting yourself. Um, boundaries. Boundaries is one of these that I want to point out. Um, if you are someone who tends to be a really great listener, you might have a lot of people coming to you right now. If you are someone who shares a lot of wise advice or allows people to share freely, you might have a lot of folks coming to you right now um, for your guidance, for your help. You need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself there also, and boundaries are really helpful to let people know if you're at your capacity for what you can take in healing wise. Um, so if someone reaches out to you and says, hey, I really need to talk or immediately starts moving into their script about how they're not doing well, stop for a moment and say, do I have the capacity for this person right now and for what they are giving to me? And if you don't make that clear with that person that, hey, I really would like to talk to you about this, but now's not the best time could we schedule a time um, later so that I can make sure I'm listening to you wholeheartedly? Um, and rest is another boundary that you can put in place. So boundary yourself with your own work, with your own, um, your own level of productivity, and make sure that rest is one of those pillars of health that you are leaning on. Um, pay attention to what you're consuming. Are you on Amazon a lot? Um, are you drinking more than you might normally? Are you um, eating more than you might normally. We are humans. We are always seeking comfort. Um, and so, you know, eating ice cream and all that's wonderful. But if I'm eating ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week, am I really nourishing my body in the way that it needs to be nourished? Probably not. So allowing yourself to, you know, have comfort and seek comfort, but also assessing if I'm overusing something. Um, meeting with a mental health professional, if you um, don't have a safe place in your life to share about what's happening or you feel a lot of pressure to, um, you know, get through it with gumption, um, or you just really need a safe place to go, check in with a mental health professional. There's nothing abnormal about experiencing um, symptoms of anxiety and depression right now. Um, so, but making sure that you are getting um, professional help there. Check in with your relationships. I know if you're in um, a partner relationship, cohabitating um, with a spouse, you are probably noticing that you're not getting the same level of, you know, connection and disconnection that you got pre-pandemic. So checking in as far as, um, do you need some of your own individual space today? Or how can we complete these chores together so that things feel, um, things feel even. Um, 
how can I help you with your need today? Or is there anything you want to share with me um, where I could just be an ear for you? Yeah, so check in with check in with whoever you're, is living in your house with you. <laughs> and, um, you know, because that in itself is its own cycle of stress that we can get trapped in. And again, another place that we really need to slow down. Um, and then also relying on the spiritual self, uh, a higher level of connectivity, checking in with nature, um, checking in with other things, you know, music, poetry, art, um, and the, the spiritual component of your life. And then I think this, I think this is my last slide. Um, there, these are a couple um, grounding techniques for anxiety. Grounding techniques are really helpful for when you're feeling overwhelmed. Um, sometimes if we are experiencing too much overwhelm, we can start to have those physiological responses. Um, we might end up having what looks like an anxiety or panic attack where it's, um, we really are having difficulty with shortness of breath. Um, racing heart, tightness across the chest. Um, so especially as, you know, we're experiencing these stress, but we're also constantly kind of scanning the environment right now for the symptoms of COVID. Um, having some grounding techniques in your back pocket are going to be really helpful so that you can see, is this overwhelm or am I actually having um, symptoms of, of the virus? So this acronym RAIN is a grounding technique that you can practice. Um, recognize what is happening. So I'm feeling really panicked right now. I'm feeling my heart beating. Um, allow it to be as it is, um, just an acceptance of what's happening in the present moment. Investigating your inner experience, what's happening for you. Um, Non-identification. So this is a pulling back. You are not your thoughts or your emotions. You are experiencing those thoughts or emotions, but you are not your thoughts or emotions. Um, grounding techniques are best practiced when you are not in a state of anxiety, because most of the time when you're in a state of anxiety, again, your thinking brain goes offline and you're more reactive. So if we want to, um, we need these grounding techniques to be there as part of our um, mental wellness tools to be practiced and used for when we're not experiencing high levels of anxiety. Connect to your senses and your environment. So what are five things that you can see around you? What are four things that you can touch? What are three things that you can smell? What, is, um, what are two things that you can taste? One thing that you can hear. Connecting to your senses is an immediate grounding. Um, activity for you to do when we're feeling overwhelmed because it physically grounds you in your current environment and it helps to create safety in that moment. Um, mindful eating is also another great, <coughs> excuse me, tool just to be able to slow down. So when I'm eating a meal, really, um, you know, paying attention to how the flavors taste, describing them to yourself. How does the food look? Again, connecting to your senses. Um, and then progressive muscle relaxation. I put two examples in here. One is squeeze lemons and the other is turtle shell. Um, these are great activities to do with children as well. Um, squeezing lemons is, you know, just that visualizing holding two lemons in your hands, squeezing as hard as you can for 30 seconds and then um, letting your hands relax. So you're getting the, um, the definition of tension versus relaxation. This is really helpful for kids to get to know um, so that they can get to know how their bodies feel when they're tense versus relaxed. Um, and it's kind of fun to visualize squeezing lemons. <laughs> um, turtle shell is the exaggeration of your shoulders up to your ears. Um, really exaggerating that for about 30 seconds and then allowing your shoulders to slide down your back. And again, getting that awareness of tension versus relaxation. So I think that's all that I had for that. And if we want to, these are just some other resources. If you are looking for um, any other great books to read. Um, and we'll put those with all the materials afterwards too. Sure. People can check them out. Absolutely. So catch your breath. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Take a drink, catch your breath. Thank you. This is awesome. Um, I was just texting with somebody. It's like, I feel like she's talking right to me. <laughs> <laughs>
I think if I could say anything to everyone, it's really normalizing, um, normalizing everything that's happening right now that, you know, stress is going to be a part of this. Um, but if you're, if you're feeling happy at times through this, that's okay. If you're feeling sad, that's okay. Everything is allowed right now and offering yourself grace and compassion for what you're experiencing, um, are, they're, they're just like nice warm blankets to provide comfort for right now. Um, so <laughs> we did have some comments and questions. Okay. I'll share those with you, but there was a question. Will this be available later? And it will. So, um, on our website, and we'll share that out afterwards. This video um, and uh, the resources, we'll make all that available. So if you can go back um, and check those out, so that will be available for replay. Um, somebody had made a comment about um, dealing with feelings of loneliness. Yes. I know it's very common right now. Mm -hmm. um, what are some suggestions on how to cope with feeling alone? Again, naming that, right? And that of course you would be feeling lonely right now because everything, um, maybe the way that you've connected to folks before, it's just not available. Um, or maybe I'm feeling really lonely because um, I'm watching all the people around me um, disregard social distancing and, and I'm doing things differently. So it's okay to acknowledge that, that I'm, you know, that I'm feeling lonely. And when we try to, you know, we help our, ourselves organize that rather than blaming other people by their actions. Um, we're taking some ownership there. So how do I, feeling lonely, how can I connect to myself? What, what do I need? Going back to, again, those basic needs. And then how, how can I provide comfort to myself? And how can I ask others who are around me to also provide comfort? Um, if you if really don't have anyone physically around you, spend some time maybe visualizing um, who those folks are in your life who are safe and love you wholeheartedly um, so that you can kind of embody what it feels like to have folks around you, whether they're there or not. Okay. Great. Um, Sarah asked, um, they're in North Carolina and uh, the more we stay in, the less we wanna go out, especially mm -hmm. kids. Um, real struggling to get them to go outside. So I worry about, she says, I worry a bit of, I worry a bit about what are the long lasting effects of having to stay in for so long. I, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. And I think that's definitely something that is certainly on my radar as a therapist. Um, the longer that this continues, what are those long lasting effects going to be? Um, knowing that there is, there's always risk, right? Like even prior to coronavirus, there's always risk in being alive. Um, we take those risks every day. We really, um, we give ourselves a sense of certainty, but there's also so much uncertainty and that's okay because the fear to live is greater than, um, or the, the will to live is greater than the fear of, of not living. So it's exposing yourself um, with precautions. So, Perhaps going to a restaurant outside, you know, or even, you know, inside the stores might be too fear inducing right now, but we're going to take our precautions of wearing masks, maybe wearing gloves and getting outside in the open air for 10 minutes at a time and then coming back in and seeing how that was for you and using those coping skills on the other end and continuing to expose ourselves in those safe ways. You know, risk is a part of life. And what we can do is take protective measures um, to keep ourselves safe. But we want to make sure, again, that we're not focusing too much on the worst case scenario. Um, because that's then when we, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. And then when we can feel very stuck and it, it can begin to snowball and catastrophize. So very great point. Um, it's definitely a valid point. Take those risks. Know that there's risks um, with safety. And, and it's okay to do it gradually, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, gradual for sure. Um, Gail asks, is it better to turn off media? It can be very confusing and unclear what to believe. What's yeah. our relationship to media? Yeah, um, that we, do we have a whole nother hour for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
yeah, I, we have to watch our, we pay attention to sources of where you're getting your information from um, and give yourself a time limit. Maybe it's 30 minutes a day is what I check in on um, just to have some sense of what's happening. But as far as watching news um, for extended amount of times, it's time to pull back from that a bit because again, we are um, we are trying to fill in the gaps of information that we don't know. And so it can kind of appear that by watching news, we're gaining more information, we might feel better um, when in fact it can end up creating this, um, this disconnect for you, whether the information is real or not. Um, so check your source, make sure they're good sources or reliable sources, um, but also give yourself a time limit for media for sure. And that includes social media as well. It's give yourself a time limit there. I, you know, I spend 30 minutes a day and then uh, I move into how I can take care of myself given the uncertainty. Great. Um, Tony asked, um, he says, uh, how do I react to people constantly complaining about the virus? It's been kind of getting on his nerves because we're all going through this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I get it, I get it. I um, how do we, Deal with other people's um, maybe it's their own ang other people's anxiety. Absolutely, we trigger our own. Yeah, no, that's absolutely. I think um, again, people wanting to share about it. It's a way, and right now too, it's a it's a way to connect, right? Like it's um, it's kind of that like social currency that if we want to have a conversation, well, the obvious topic we might talk about is um, is coronavirus. Um, so I'll say again, boundaries. If a conversation feels um, like it, it's going in that negative dark direction or a lot of complaining, maybe I spend less time with that person. Or maybe I directly say, I've already had a conversation about coronavirus this morning. I hear what you're saying, but I really don't have the capacity to talk about it right now. Could we probably talk, could we try to talk about something else and see if we can switch and reframe the conversation? It's okay to let people know that you've had too much. Hmm. Great. And uh, Sue asked, uh, what about deliberately withdrawing or isolating myself, not wanting to engage with others? Um, so I think she's saying, I'm feeling this. What about, what about feeling like you want to withdraw? Right. I, I want to I ask, you know, is this an over... How long has it been happening for? Am I starting to notice that maybe I'm developing, um, you know, that I'm really self-isolating? Is it, am I noticing other symptoms of depression? Um, am I noticing a fear of being around other people? Um, this might be a time where I really need to start um, caring for myself and maybe I need to reach out to a mental health professional and talk about the isolation. Because mm -hmm. um, being isolated for too long, it you know it goes against um, what we need as humans. We need that connection. So you know, as I was saying before, we can really be in that numbing state. Um, isolation can definitely happen and occur. We want to make sure that we are reaching out to a mental health professional who can help us there. Great, great. Thank you. And thank you for, for sharing that too. That's mm -hmm. that sharing part of your story. What's happening for you? Um, Reach out, absolutely. Great. Um, I think we're just about it at noon. So um, I have lots of comments here um, and I've been getting some texts just about how wonderful this has been and, and how good. And um, I am um, really grateful because uh, I think in a situation like this, these things we're feeling that we might be unaccustomed to um, given the, the stresses that we're under and to know that we're not alone. Right. And, and there are some, you know, pretty straightforward and some, some pretty basic things, even in terms of our breathing or body that can, can help us. So it's, it's not, um, there are some steps that we can take ourselves. Yeah. Actionable strategies, Reagan said in the yes. chat. That's the word. That's <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yes. Don't forget the power of uh, simple acts um, and meeting those basic needs, but you're right. We're, you are not alone. We are, we may not all, what is that phrase? We may not all be in the same boat, but we're all in the same storm right now. Mm -hmm. um, there is no shame in reaching out. And um, if anyone has any follow-up questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would be happy to help provide anything else. Great. 
um, and we shared Rebecca's information in the chat. It'll this will all be on our website with information about our practice, video resources. We'll make sure that's all there, and people can go go back to it as well. And this is a topic that even before the pandemic, I really want us to keep at the forefront because it affects us, all of us, and people we love so much. Um, it's really important that we take away the taboo of it and the mm -hmm. silence around mental health and continue keep having this conversation, especially during these times. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> thank you everybody for tuning in. Yeah. Thank I want to thank everybody. We're going to wrap it up now because it's 12 o'clock. Um, and as Pastor G said, and I said toward the beginning, we would be happy to have some follow up if, if things have come up for you, feel free to follow up with Lindsay or Pastor G or me. Um, and Pastor G was even offering, you know, on Tuesday evening, I mean, she'd be happy to host a, a conversation group just to see what's come up for people Tuesday at 630. So let us know one way or the other, if you have some interest in continuing this conversation in some way, and we are more than happy to create space um, for that to happen. So uh, shoot us, everybody there, just shoot us an email, let us know. Um, we'd love to keep supporting everybody in this. And Rebecca, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Anytime. Yeah, great. Okay, we're going to wrap up, everybody. Thank you so much. You all take care, be well, and be in touch. Thanks, Rebecca. Bye. Bye.